I have traveled across the length and breadth of India, and I've not seen one person who's a beggar, who is a thief. Such wealth I have seen in this country, such high moral values, people of such caliber, that I do not think we would ever conquer this country, unless we break the very backbone of this nation, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. And therefore, I propose that we replace her old and ancient education system, her culture. For if the Indians think that all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, their native culture, and they will become what we want them, a truly dominated nation. Although the devious plan of this so-called noble, so-called lord from England was implemented successfully, still India remains the closest life example of what kind of things would the survivors teach the primitive people they encounter. Although the Vedic literature, the Vedic scriptures, also underwent editions during which probably a lot of the meaning was lost, as usual they were disguised as language reforms, we know that song from previous episodes, but yet they remain the closest that we have to the original teachings of the survivors as they are, along with the scriptures, the holy books of the Zoroastrians. portion of the Vedas, the Vedic sacred books, the old scriptures of India, does deal with history and it goes back all the way to the time when our universe was created by a single living being called Brahma. Everything we see around is just a display of his creativity. Everything without exception, the earth, millions of others like it, and even our very self, our souls, are also expansion of his own being because he is an aspect of the Supreme Lord, the all-pervading consciousness. And then as far as the history of the earth, a really extreme antiquity is mentioned when still powerful dragons, very wise dragons of goodness, inhabited Bumi, that's how they call the earth, one of the names also Prithvi, Bumi Devi, Prithvi Devi. These wise dragons, which were far superior than us, are not to be confused with the reptilian races, which are currently involved very actively in influencing our society. In the Vedas and also in some old sacred books from the state of Tamil Nadu, we have references to a lost ancient continent called Kumari Kandam. The location of the continent and to some extent the story which is told about it is confirmed by the set material channeled by Jane Roberts, which sadly remains, at least for me, the only absolutely most reliable source for extremely ancient history. And as far as the relatively recent history of Bhumi Devi, the Vedas clearly speak about times, very recent times, when righteous rulers spread their influence all over the world, which is exactly what we find in terms of artifacts and cultural heritage. I've been showing that for many episodes already. We find the traces of a single worldwide civilization. And most importantly, that social structure was meant 
to serve as a direct bridge between the benevolent higher advanced living beings in the universe and the human races. We were repeatedly brainwashed in school that all the cultures were primitive and limited to their lands or maximum the continent because of this ongoing endeavor to erase any trace of the message of the benevolent forefathers and our creators who gave us the instructions of Sanatana Dharma, the teachings of how to live in happiness and prosperity and at the same time get on well with our education as learning souls the purpose for which we were born. So let me show you a few curious things left from the times when the Hindus were still following the Sanatana Dharma. The so-called musical pillars at Hampi, India, are one of the examples for designing certain um, interior architectural elements as musical instruments. Each pillar plays a given musical note and you can play music on them. Some of the pillars are missing. They have been destroyed by the British, they thought. Well, let's see how they made it. Some of the pillars must be hollow, that's why the stone appears to have different density or something like that. So they even damaged the temple just to find out that the columns are not hollow. They're just made using a technique we simply don't understand. But we have very good knowledge of how to destroy everything, dissect it. And then we show great creativity in finding the stupidest explanations for what we have done. For example, with the money that we pay every day as taxes, even when you go to the shop you pay 20% tax just because you want to buy some food. All that goes to various laboratories where animals and lots of people are tortured. But we close our eyes and say, oh, this is done in the name of discovering new medicines so that the humanity doesn't suffer. If really better healthcare was the actual intention, Ayurvedic traditional Hindu medicine would be implemented in all hospitals around the world along with the very advanced Tibetan traditional medicines and along with countless other natural cures that we still haven't forgotten. Countless scientific publications show that these medicines, even in their nowadays downgraded version, are far more efficient than the poisons that we are being administered by the modern pharmacists. Next to the musical pillars at Hampi hung chains made of stone. The British destroyed that as well. They were not sure how was it made exactly, so the reaction is destroy. Fortunately, we have some examples which survived in other temples. Now please look at the top part of the temple at Hampi. Please note how the building technique and style is absolutely identical to that of the temples I showed you in the couple of previous episodes, those from Cambodia, Myanmar, Indonesia, Thailand, China, and here in Vietnam as well, and all the way to Teotihuacan in Mexico again, some people came and taught the locals how to make very strong cement and dress stone with cement. So the history as it is given in the Hindu Vedas and tells us about wise people who were on educational missions all around the world is very well confirmed by the artifacts and whatever little historic records have escaped destruction and meaning twisting editions. For example, the quote you heard in the very beginning of this video sounds practically identical to the description of the societies, the local communities of South America, which were as prosperous and advanced as India when the same colonial forces arrived with the intent to trash anything godly and nice.
In Egypt, we also have vague remains of oral history uh, being transmitted from generation to generation, and they also speak of a worldwide civilization to which the advanced, glorious Egypt belonged. The Elora Caves in India the sheer scale of everything, the sheer size, strips of credibility, all official explanations of how all this was made. Elora is just one of the many such sites in India. I won't even discuss making all this manually, the simple way, as we are told. Forget about making it, we can't even destroy it manually. Yes, foreign invaders mobilized divisions and sent them to destroy this temple, but the stone is so hard that they could only inflict minor damages in a long, long time. Eventually, the destroyers just gave up. They reported mission impossible. The stone is too hard. There is an entire network of intricate tunnels below the Elora Caves. Very little is known about them for the simple reason that they are too small for a human to go in. The devices can tell us very little, only confirming that the tunnels continue very deep inside the bedrock. I wonder what the penguins would come up as an explanation for this. Maybe like the tunnels in Central Asia, they told us small children made them. Oh, must have been the same situation here. I don't see any problems with um, two, three months newborn babies. They certainly, maybe they can fit their head inside the tunnels. Oh, so everything is confirmed. It means humans can make them. So the topic about constructing this uh, type of temples in India came up during a past life regression conducted by Anton Aksinov, the person thanks to whom we have discovered this amazing information that the uh, stone was grown like mushrooms, like plants in antiquity. And he is the only person that I am aware of who systematically and responsibly uses trans states as a tool to recover history. So here the question put in front of the person who was in trance was did the Hindus as we know them today build these temples? The answer was of course not. The actual builders as a human type disappeared not so long ago, some 250-300 years ago. And later on in this regression session, he saw how there were far bigger structures than what we can see now, but everything was sealed, so to say, archived, because there were very special places of power which had to be hidden from the small stupid people the race which was about to come, that means me and you. Because the small people wouldn't know how to utilize these places of power. For example, some people would come to such holy places preloaded with ideas for aggression, for example. And so the most special places of power were archived with uh, layers of stone manifested on the top or maybe grown to protect us, amongst other reasons which are not necessarily less important, from our own destructive thoughts, which would materialize much faster if we were able to get in contact with those special places and the crystals kept in them. The builders of these majestic caves were type of people taller than us. They are not only to be seen depicted again and again. They are also in the oral history, the traditional history, which some people in India still have not forgotten. Of course, 
Now we live in modern times and Indians, as most people, foolishly imagine that they live in a sovereign country. So they noticed that the history which uh, the British forced on them is fraudulent and there are some attempts to introduce changes. But I assure you that those changes would be more or less meaningless because India, as all other countries, is just a province of the empire of evil. It is still relatively safe to find out the truth and keep it for yourself as long as you shut up and stay at home. But as far as organized attempts to enlighten people on a larger scale, until we live in the current paradigm, that will be quickly taken care of. If not some international organization, then the international banks of the hyenas will do the job. This is a very interesting finding at the quarry at Mahabali Param. It illustrates one of the techniques used to quarry rock. They would make a very deep hole in the stone, in the boulder. Then they would split the boulder. Giant cuttings were made in this way. It looks pretty simple until you actually have to do it. Really, we can't even do it with our modern machines. We do employ a similar method, but we're not there yet. We need many, many such cuttings to split a single boulder. We don't yet know the single hole technique. This is almost 200 years old. Also, many cuttings. But at Mahabali Param, they could do it with one only. And even that one single cutting, how did they make it in the very hard stone with primitive instruments? The columns of certain temples in the state of Karnataka have become pretty popular lately. Finally, we found something in these magnificent old temples which is simple enough for us to comprehend something that our simplistically tuned intellect can relate to. All the other stuff with the endless intricate carvings and all of they have meanings. This is just too overwhelming for the simplistic mindset of the modern man. So another reason for which these columns are so famous is that they have been made using late machine. Or at least, and that's how they look like. Constructing a late machine that could have handled columns of this size is work for people who know quite a bit about engineering. But I find the fineness of the artwork much more impressive than the late machines. Just look at this, an entire complex artwork very difficult to make and for what? for just a couple of centimeters of minor border. Here they shaped every single bead from his decoration. Just look at this necklace. There is a one or two millimeters cut between the body of the lady and the necklace. Why? Or what about these tiny faces? They're completely hollow inside. One could insert a twig not only between the two ears, but also mouth two ears and so on. Why? And how did they chisel it out with needle? And again, such a tiny small holes somewhere at a minor border for decoration. Again, why? And as usual, as we noticed also at other places, the older the temple, the more 
advanced, at least for our understanding, technology would have been required to build it. Or who knows? Maybe we are even asking the wrong questions. Maybe they didn't even need any technology at all. Sometimes in the past life regressions that I've been referring to, there are mentions that even a couple of hundred years ago, still races of uh, people existed which could uh, still manifest things just with their thoughts materialize them from the ether plane without the need of any tools. I propose that we replace her old and ancient education system, her culture. For if the Indians think that all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, and they will become what we want them, a truly dominated nation. And how did the English accomplish this task? How did they convince the Indians to abandon the ancient path of Sanatana Dharma, of a godly life? Of course, the British employed means that they have already found to be very effective over time, like concentration camps, cruel genocides, and other similar tactics. The parties who organized all this are not held responsible till date. So that they organize more, of course. Currently, there is something like this going on for years in Africa, but it is very much under the radar. And even when it does get some news coverage, that is done in a very misleading light, as if some bad local people are killing some people all oh, far away Africa. Of course, we have nothing to do with that. Yeah, better I put on the TV and start watching football. And these things from Africa, they're just depressing. I don't want to know more about this. And so, after destroying and plundering as much as they could and killing as many as they could, the British went to the next step, replacement of the history and the education. They said, India doesn't have any historic records of her own, and that's why they felt the need to give it a history. There was no need of research or things like that. The history was already ready. And when they were fabricating the newly written history of India, it was very easy for them to find authoritatively looking quotes. Because in those times, India meant a faraway, unknown place. That's why the travelers, centuries ago, called India places in America, places in Africa, places in China, in Persia, in the Middle East, even in nowadays India. All these were various Indias. So, when they were cooking up the new history of India, they could write, pretty much anything they wished, and they would find the confirmation quote somewhere, very easily. For example, in this single map alone, one can see three Indias. Of course, all the quotes which were patched up together to provide the backbone for the newly fabricated Indian history were always accounts given by foreigners. Like, for example, the account of Alexander the Great, written by Aristotle himself. It sounds so legitimate. Let's look at some of the details about the weather mentioned in those accounts. About the weather of India, it was, according to his words, six months um, summer and six months winter. And what kind of winter? 30 men drowned in the snow. They couldn't bury them because they fell so deep uh, inside the snow. Wow! According to Aristotle, some 500 troops out of uh, the soldiers of Alexander the Great died in India due to very heavy snowfall. 
And then how does this account describe the people of India? Hmm. They wear skins of seals. Of course, India does have a couple of high mountains where snowfall occurs, but if Alexander the Great was marching to it with an army, with an intent to conquer it, would he and could he teleport himself directly to the highest mountain peaks with the snow and the seals? <laughs> and miss out completely the normal parts of the country? All these stories with the seals and the extreme snowfall, this could be also a legitimate account of India, but the question is which India? It really doesn't seem to be the current India. In this newly fabricated history, of course, the Indians were presented as people believing in strange religious things who didn't even know who they are until somebody from Europe, of course, came and found them to tell them who they are. Which is, of course, yet another lie. Here on the walls of an old Indian temple, we see a person with a typically European outfit and features. So apparently the Indians were connected with the Europeans. Well, maybe these were not the right Europeans from the point of view of those who came to murder and destroy. Here also, the man on the right is depicted in a very different manner from the way the Indians depict themselves with, a, all the, f with the full set of jewelry and the hairstyle and so on. This man looks a Roman Top to bottom. Here we have an entire scene of uh, foreigners, probably Africans, coming with a giraffe. They seem to be handing something, maybe gifts to the Indian Maharaja on the elephant. And I say foreigners because the people around the giraffe, uh, they are distinctly different from the Indians who are always depicted with full set of jewelry and the typical Indian outfits. And by the way, transporting a live giraffe all the way from Africa is not that easy in terms of logistics. So in India, as everywhere else, we see the same picture. People were very well connected with the rest of the world. They were part of the one world culture, a culture which honored the gods and the principles of goodness. In the past, these bridges, cultural bridges, between different types of people, different races, they were created to enrich those who were involved, to make their lives better. While nowadays the same idea of one world and brotherhood and everybody loves each other, all this is preached with the exactly opposite purpose. So the one world culture was something beneficial when it was used to spread the message of the benevolent gods, our creators. But when the same concept is used to expand and strengthen the cobweb of evil, well, think twice before enthusiastically voting for that. Jata me ganga, jata me ganga, jata me ganga, trilo chana trisula dar, jata me ganga, trilo chana trisula dar, namo ke laja pati, sativara bhumane. So, 
as we saw in our episode about Japan, even the modern Hindu pundits, Sonata Dhamma pundits, started becoming aware that actually their rishis, the sages, their original teachers, they came from the North Pole, which is exactly the place where Hyperborea used to be. They didn't decide that just by listening to beautiful abstract Vedic poetry. There was a much more exact science behind it. A branch of the Vedas is called Jyotish Shastra, and it deals mainly with astrology. But this astrology is backed up by amazingly precise and good knowledge of astronomy. So to make the long story short, they tried to discover places based on records of how the stars were located at a given moment. Also, they would know the time because the time would be recorded along with the stars. For example, this is a traditional kundali or what we in the West call astrological chart, somebody's birth chart. So always in this uh, kundali, they need to calculate very, very precisely the exact position of all planets. But when they try to determine where exactly in India was a given historic thing taking place, they found out that it's not even in India. And then they started looking for a place at which the given Kundali would have been correct for the time for which it has been made. They did find such a place, but it turned out it's not even in India. And what is that place? It's the North Pole, exactly the location of Hyperborea. So during the history of the Earth, various groups were coming to educate the simple cavemen to mingle with them, to intermarry them, to teach them technology, religion. But in the relatively recent times, it seems that those who were doing it with good intentions were the Hyperboreans. Did they do it directly themselves or was it people who lived in the now cold areas of Europe and Siberia, were they spreading the knowledge which they received from the Hyperboreans? We don't know exactly yet, but the truth seems to be coming out lately. Not only the Indians discovered the Hyperborean connection, but also there is something going on in Russia, something which may end up playing the leading role in the upcoming big events on Earth, and yet there is no news coverage of it currently. Parasitic mass media will waste your time with all kinds of rumors, gossips, or straightforward lies about Putin, mostly. But they don't want you to know that many simple Russians lately are becoming aware of the Vedic roots of their Slavic culture, Yes, exactly, Vedic. And this is how they call it as well, even in their own language. The keywords are Vediceska Rus or Slavyanskie Vedai means Slavic Vedas. Since we were always told to connect the Vedic literature with India only, somebody may get confused and think that uh, the Russians are looking for connections with, with India and that's why they have adopted the term or something like that. But this is not so. There were Slavic Vedas. People just rediscovered them. They are called Vedas as well, even in our own Slavic languages. The verb Veda, Vedi, means to know. It is still in use in some Slavic languages and even those that don't use it are aware still. If they hear, they will, it will sound to them like an archaic word, but they will understand it. Not only the name of the literature is the same, the message is also the same, left by what in India is called the Adityas. 
the advanced beings of goodness or the gods of goodness. Scripts which were used in very old times in all these Nordic regions of Europe and also in Siberia, they are very similar to the Devanagari script, which is the main script used for writing down the Indian Vedic literature. So what is this big change in Russia, which the monster big mainstream media doesn't want to tell you much about? The thing is that too many Russians recently simply started abandoning the parasitic paradigm and they simply leave its grip. They go to live in the wild. And this is not just a way for some people to avoid the cobweb of evil. This is the only way to do it. If you continue sitting at home and while having the TV on, while drinking alcohol, you swear loud out of hatred for the banksters and all your other slave masters, you will never get out of the cobweb. Indeed, your hatred is what it feeds off. It is exactly your feelings of anger, desperation and helplessness which provide the fuel for this cobweb. This is an incomplete map of settlements, entire settlements of people who have decided to leave the cobweb. The first wave were really the type of people which most people would describe as New Age type folks. But then the second wave, which is much bigger and much more powerful, are usually people with relatively high positions in society, people with uh, higher education, people that would be described as intellectuals. They decided, why should they stay in the city and get sprayed with poison trails and live in a pollution and noise? amongst hyena-like people. If I can go and live in one of these communities, the way my forefathers did. I think the English term for this type of settlements is eco-settlements, but in Russia they call them Rodovaya Pasileni, which means clan settlements. So, of course, these people came straight out from the cobweb. They didn't even know much how was it exactly that their forefathers lived in harmony with nature. You see, this one didn't even manage to pack the right type of trousers. But as Edgar Casey told us, it will take some time, but they will learn. So here he says, it will take years for it to be crystallized, but out of Russia comes again the hope of the world. And yet another Edgar Casey quote confirming the same. And he is not the only proven prophet who said that the first sprouts of the paradigm of love and peace will appear in Russia. But amongst the common people, this should not be confused with Putin or any other centralized organization. The government of Russia is almost as corrupt and rotten as that of the United States of America or the United States of Europe. Yes, one could say that the mass media in Russia is slightly more truthful than the rest of the world, but the overall situation is not much different. Same poisons sprayed from the skies and the rest of the package. So this is a typical house of one of these settlements in Russia, Rodovoye Pasilenie. Not everybody can afford a better looking house straight away, but that's not important for them. At this point, the people who go there understand that the most important for them is freedom to start with and then the full process of reuniting again with nature. Although at this point, some people living in the woods in so-called clan settlements can barely look like something that could shake the parasitic cobweb, but it seems eventually they will. Listen again to an Edgar Casey quote. 
unless there is interference from what may be called by many the supernatural forces and influences that are active in the affairs of nations and peoples. The whole world, as it were, will be set on fire by the militaristic groups and those that are for power and expansion in such associations. Germany is the only other place in the world, at least that I'm aware of, where such communities of cobweb communities started appearing in such a great concentration as Russia. That is why the German government took drastic measures to rise the crime levels. That was accomplished through the medium of various governmental programs and initiatives. And as usual, they had very humanitarian sounding names. And Scandinavia, up until a couple of decades ago, when only local Scandinavian people used to live there, the crime rates were extremely low, much lower than anywhere else in the world. Just the nature of the people over there was like that. And where have you reached now, after a couple of decades of hard governmental work on lowering the sum total of the human consciousness there? We have war zones there, no-go zones. Even policemen avoid entering those zones. Immediately they are attacked with uh, fire, with stones, their cars get burned down. They need bulletproof vests, vehicles, special equipment. And how could the most peaceful people on earth be reduced to such a miserable conditions in just a couple of decades? Well, with the various government-organized programs, of course, and all of them under the slogan of loving everybody especially in an international way. So lately I was reading the records of the regressions of Anton Aksenov and especially the topic of the New Age, which he calls the New Space. According to the information which he obtained from various people independently, people in trance, I mean. This new space is a kind of a new layer of reality, which was initially created by this very same race, the Hyperboreans, or the people who learned from them. Anybody who has a human body, who every soul which wears a human body currently, can get plugged in to this new reality gradually. Of course, this would be kind of predetermined already at the point when the soul makes the plan for its future incarnation. And the souls who have decided to take this path and plug into this new layer, initially in them this would manifest as a strong urge, call from inside to reconnect with nature and start learning from it. According to the channel the information, although the Hyperboreans lived on earth in what we would classify as historic times, they created the new space for the current historic moment. Because being advanced as they were, they or maybe at least some of their shamans, or even maybe beings from the astral realm who are responsible for overseeing the flow of historic events on Earth, as they saw that the balance between good and evil on Earth is seriously disrupted to the point at which the situation is no longer conductive for the souls to learn their karmic lessons. At this point, they decided to create a new space for those who do not wish to live in the parasitic mesh, don't feel comfortable in it, they will have a place to escape. Exploring the new space is completely optional. Those who 
find it acceptable to have an implant stuck in their brains so that somebody can control them remotely. They can remain in the cobweb for as long as they wish. They will remain as long as they believe in it. Actually, from what we can learn about Atlantis from Edgar Casey, it seems they reached a very similar point, like us, nowadays. He said that the forces of evil in Atlantis came up with such machines and devices that eventually they even started tempering with this path of the souls, with the very structure of the earthly realm and all this setup of souls incarnating under blind conditions while particles of them remain in the astral plane to oversee the entire learning process. So, as I have covered already many times, evil is a teacher. It is meant to test us, to teach us. But when it comes to the point that it makes the learning process impossible, of course, the full experiment, the full setup will need to be reset, to be changed. That's what they did in Atlantis. And this is the point that we are also nearing. I don't know, in months or in years, they will start hunting people on the streets and putting implants in them by force. Well, that's a bit extreme. How can you learn if you don't even have a choice? than to become a remotely controlled zombie. And it seems exactly at that point the higher forces which oversee the development of the civilizations on Earth will start getting involved very actively. At least that's what the prophets who have proven themselves are telling us. Since most of us have been born and grown up in the environment of very dense ignorance, for many this process of learning from nature, at least initially, will be kind of mild and symbolic. And it could be still categorized as just increased creativity, very strong intuition, things like this. While for others who already from previous lives have a background in magic and have already taken some lessons in previous lives in manipulating the material energy with thought forms and things like this, they could start at a higher level, they could even make contacts with various nature spirits. So what would be the meaning in very practical terms of being plugged in to this new layer, the new space? The main thing is more flexibility, which means that thought forms would materialize as objects or events much faster. Oh, thank you, thank you, Supreme God. You are such a wise engineer of our layer where people mention items from the toilet environment after every syllable, not only they think it, they even say it, which is even more powerful. Words have the power of a magic spell in more flexible environments or spheres, layers, spaces like the new space. Imagine in what kind of sewage would we swim if things were manifesting as fast as some people who preach the so-called very simple and effective law of attraction. Luckily, it doesn't work as easy as they describe it. Otherwise, we wouldn't find any place to hide from our ugly manifestations of all the anger, frustration, jealousy, fear, revengefulness, and etc. Because this is what the majority of the people feel most of the time. But the new space will be a learning environment. For example, one would find it difficult to hurt an animal in that environment 
because the body of those who are plugged in will be more finely tuned and the waves of the suffering of this animal will be felt in your own being directly. That is just one example illustrating how does it feel to live in a lighter environment, lighter layer, flexible one. Getting plugged to the new space will be much easier for those who live in a natural environment. It will be harder in the cities and not only because the noise and the pollution will make it hard to concentrate. The towers of death, the black magic of the governments, are specifically designed to tune your brain to the layer of reality with abundant sewage around, anger, frustration and fear. It is not by chance that when so-called ordinary people visit the Arctic or Antarctic regions, they very often report spontaneously reaching altered states of consciousness. In many cases, uh, even astral visions open in front of them. In many cases, these are people who have no interest in meditation, spirituality, or anything of that sort. Now, most modern people would describe this as strange phenomena, or they will consider the altered states of consciousness as strange or unusual themselves. But the truth is that if you live in a human body and you don't experience such things, that is even stranger. Because the human race has inbuilt capabilities and not using them means closing ourselves to a very small portion of reality, refusing to see the rest. Now, the organs and functionalities in our bodies, which are responsible for astral experiences, they are suppressed by the black magic waves from the dead towers. The radiation and noise from various gadgets and devices around us by Wi-Fi and other similar invisible frequencies and various poisons administered to us by the water supply, doctors, etc. Actually, the effect of the towers and the waves and radiation from various devices is so strong that just by getting away from that and going to the Arctic or the Antarctic regions, where they don't have them installed, this getting away by itself is enough for so many people and they start perceiving astral things directly without any endeavor or even asking for it. They always had the organs for this, but because it was suppressed and also nobody explained them what they have, they were not even aware they have them. Living in the countryside, wouldn't uh, give that fantastic results as uh, being in Antarctica or the Arctic region. But still, some relief will be there, proportionate to how remote the region is. Okay, so to wind up the topic of India, the subject of this episode, I would like to recommend a couple of um, readings to you. First of all, the famous book, The Autobiography of a Yogi. It will give you a good idea about the actual magic India. Although this is a witness account um, of events which took place after the British invasion, still it may provide a vague idea of what was it even before that. And the other reading that I would like to recommend to you, this is Bhagavad Gita, the most famous holy book in India, part of the Vedic scriptures. 
Now, Gita has many translations in Hindi and in English, and not all of them are good, because the original is in Sanskrit, and Sanskrit is such a language, each word can have 40, 60 meanings. So, which is the correct one? It's a very much a matter of interpretation and personal views. That's why I recommend this particular translation of Shailendra Sharma. It is a relatively short reading, 18 chapters. The six which are in the middle are considered as core teachings. Shankara Giri Jaw, 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 Giri Jaw,